Thank you. So good afternoon or good morning, depends on the hour. Um, first of all, let me say thank you to Dr. Sidaris and Skevos, to the scientific committee for organizing this, co this conference and for invitation. I'm very happy and this is my first time in Athens. So um, I prepared my talk about substrate mapping because I think it's very important in the context of VT ablation. These are my disclosures. So the ideal flow chart in the setting of VT ablation is first to build up an electrical substrate map. So you want to create the geometry and you want to understand where, the, where healthy tissue is from the scar. And then you want to study the abnormal, the abnormal propagation of the art. So you want to understand exactly where the slow conduction are. This is what we do at our institution. You see the red is the, all the potential inside the QRS. And, and uh, when they are the slow conduction, you have some late activity. And this island of a violet uh, color is represented by late potential. So the key points in this figure is that we want to study the electrical propagation and to localize where area are, where the area of the VT circuit most likely are. And so we place usually our pentaray cutter, so the multi-spline, multi-electric tool, because we want to uh, depict the full diastolic pathway, like in this case. You see on the left panel, you see the entrance and the isthmus, and on the right panel, you have the exit side of the VT circuit. And then you place your ablation catheter on this area, and you see in 10 seconds, you interrupt the VT circuit, and you have the sinus rhythm restoration. So then you want to link the abnormal activity you have recorded with the VT reentrant circuits because you want to establish an endpoint. The endpoint is to have the complete electrical silence. You see the first map on the left is the one we started. So you see there is an area of lay potential quite big. Then we ablated. There is a second picture because we did a, a, a remap. And you see there is still some area of lay potential. So we ablated more, and you see at the last map, the last panel shows an almost complete abolition of lay potential. So we should always aim, we should always reach this kind of abolition of lay potential. And I will show you later uh, the reason. And this is what you like at the end of the procedure, the non-inducibility. So the patient should not be any more um, induced. So this is the whole procedure of the VT, the VT ablation. So the first part is represented by the mapping and by the ablation. So you're treating the patient. And then you have a second part represented by the prevention. So you link the abnormal substrate to the VT secret and you abolish every lay potential expression of slow conduction. So you prevent the patient to come back to the, to the lab. So the agenda of today will be why the substrate is so important. So yesterday, how was it? How is it today and how will it be tomorrow? So it's very important to define the substrate mapping because first, you have to distinguish where the scar is and where the healthy tissue is. And then you have to understand where the late potential and lava are. And then you have to orientate yourself in the chamber of interest and then because you want to improve the long-term outcome of VT ablation. And the substrate is like a soccer game or rugby game, or rugby game. so you have, to know, you have to understand the rules. So you have to know which materials, which cutters, what you're looking at. So you have always asked to, uh, you have always uh, to ask yourself which is the best cutter uh, which side they should map, endocardial, epicardial, and then what are the targets, so lava or lay potential, and then should I do an activation or a subset only map. And this is what we do. Um, so these are the tiny signal we are looking at. So the first you see under the QRS are the lava, local abnormal ventricular activity, and then there are lay potential. Oh, thank you. So this is the this is the QRS. So this is the QRS. You see the surface ECG, 
and down here you see all these fractionated EGM which are represented by lava. And then you have this such tiny signal here, well represented here, that are the lay potential. So we are looking for these signals. And the reason is because, as you see from this Kavan-Mayan curve, the patients that at the end of the procedure are non-inducible and plus you abolish every lay potential are going much better when compared to patients where V2, VT is not inducible but you did not chase every lay potential. And this is a paper from our group published in Circulation 2014. So the electrical substrate yesterday was characterized by these such spiky geometries you see were made by the ablation catheter. You see less than 50 points maybe, but these were the first representation of, uh, of the ventricles. So the first time that we recorded the scar, the, uh, the red, so the, where is red is scar, where is border zone, and then the healthy tissue. So this was the first representation ever of VT. And, um, and this was made by Marchinsky in circulation 2000. And the amplitude was defined as 1.5 millivolt um, healthy and below 0 0.5 SCAR. And then you see here another paper published in 2003 by a Canadian group. They tried to define the target area when there was a, a lower capture threshold 10 milliampere and 2 milliseconds width. But the substrate modification um, currently uh, are the following. So the first one is the, uh, the homogenization by Dibiase. It's an anatomical base only on scale identification, so there is no electrophysiology here. It's, a, it's just a homogenization wherever you are. And indeed, I like this free approach. So uh, our approach based on lay potential, the lava based by the Bordeaux group, and then Berwezzo that proposed the channeling. And these are electrical, these are just for electrophysiologists, I do believe, so you have to search for abnormal activity and eliminate them. So the electrical substrate today is characterized by, uh, this is the key word, I do believe, is the multi-electrode. And when you do, uh, when you do uh, this search on PubMed, you see there is an increase of, uh, uh, of publication. And so today, the keywords are these, Pentaray, so for the Carter system, there is the Orion for the Boston Scientific, and then the HD grid by Abbott. And these are the new hashtag for people that love Twitter, so high density, the capability to distinguish near field versus far field, and then the activation wavefront as well, the software algorithms. So you see, these are the substrate mapping we are now able to create in our labs. So there is high density. And you see clearly this patient was a patient with um, ARVD, with dysplasia of the right ventricle. You see the scar is extending from the RVOT to the uh, inferior aspect of the RV, very basal, and also to the inferior wall, when here is healthy tissue. And so if you can magnify, you see there is a high definition of the subset, so you can tell exactly what's going on here, and you can distinguish the normal tissue from the scar. And uh, also, you can uh, tell the high definition of a scar is critically dependent upon the activation wavefront, the electrical sides, and also the intellectual distance, which are the properties of the catheters we are using at. So these are the signals we are characterizing. So you see the, um, we are looking at, we can really distinguish the near field potential. So these potential are those potential that are happening just below your catheter. So it's a sharp, it's very high frequency compared to this signal, which is a far field signal, which is very rounded is very low frequency. So with this multi-electron mapping tool, you can distinguish the two. And then this is the cut by the Abbott system, is the HD grid. You can tell there are um, 16 electrodes you see here and are able to map the, the signal along the spline, 
but also across the spline. So what you can get is these beautiful maps uh, from one acquisition. You can have this one, so you see there is a really a extended area of scar. Then you have another one, uh, same patient along the spline, so just an acquisition made by this uh, sense of the spline, and then with the algorithm present in this system. And when you compare the all three, you can tell the scar is really different. So it's very important to use the correct mapping catheter. And when you compare the new mapping technology with the previous one where we were able to map only with the ablation catheter, you can tell the difference between the two. So the secret is the shorter distance, the best resolution, the best characterization. And then you can play with the algorithms that are now integrated in our mapping system. You see here, this is the bipolar map, an extended area of a scar, and on the right, the propagation map during sinus rhythm, and this is the line of block, this white color here, this white line, which is added automatically by the system. But also you can play with other algorithms like the one by Baston Scientific. This is the Lumi point. And you see during science room, this is the highlighted area uh, automatically done by the system, which corresponded exactly to the VT circuit. You see here, this is the entrance, the isthmus, and the exit site of it, the VT. So, this is the Orion tool. It's a really great cutter. The electrode is very tiny. It's 1.4 millimeters squared and is 1.7 millimeter the inter-electrode distance. This is able to map such tiny, really tiny, long fractionated EGMs. So when to understand when to go AP and when to go endo. So these are some cases I did uh, together with Professor De La Bella. So this is a patient, 48 years old, with myocardial infarction, ejection fraction 38%. And this patient had the VT despite amiodarone. You can tell here is a VT coming from the inferior wall. The uh, QRS are negative in the uh, D2D3 AVF. And the AVL is positive, so it's coming from the right to the left. And the precordial leads um, suggest coming, is coming from the med medial ventricular wall or the, of the left ventricle. So we started with this map, so endocardially. You see this is our subset mapping, and uh, it's quite healthy here. And at the basal portion of the posterior wall, there is an area of scar. But when we went unipolar, so you have always in it's always very important to look at the unipolar map because in this case, you see, it's, um, it's showing you there is a large extended area of scar compared to that one. So when also the late potential activity, you see the weren't is always white. There is something here, but not so present. So what we did is to try to induce the VT and uh, we did not map the VT, there was no circuit endocardially. So we did the puncture, and you see this is the epicardial scar, very, very big, huge, that the unipolar one was showing us from the endo. And also the lay potential activity was really big. You see very red and also borders in the um, green and blue area. So. We induce the VT, and as you see, we place this decaporal catheter, and here you have all the VT circuit, the entrance, the isthmus, and the exit side. So this is the full depiction of the VT circuit. And then we did a remap, you see. So this is the first map, this is the second map. You see there is a change, but there is still some area of lay potential. So with the uh, ablate, with uh, you see also the signal. There is still some signal present. So we ablated more until we have this this uh, abolition of the signal. And you see clearly now the complete abolition of the signal. So here there is lot of late potential. There is some late potential here, and then at the last remap, no late potential. So and this is obviously the uh, uh, last ECG you see. Uh, for extra steam, no inducibility. 
So lay potential are DVT secret and is always codified for DVT secret. This is another case. Is a patient with myocarditis. Uh, is a uh, an epicardial scar. You see very huge and also the unipolar was concordant to the, the bipolar. And uh, when we were mapping, you see there is an area of lay potential. You see coming very late after the QRS and the core of the lay potential is in this area. And uh, this is uh, what we have found. You see the activation. So this is the entrance. A little bit down is the isthmus. Here, you see the mid-diastolic potential, and a little bit down is indeed the exit. So this is what we do in our lab to depict the full di uh, diastolic cycle length. And this is the propagation. You see the entrance, sorry, the exit, outer loop, then there is a wavefront collision here, entrance, isthmus, and so on. So, um, and this is the remap you see before and after. There is no more lay potential at the same area. So before and after. So this is the lay potential activity and here at the same place, no uh, uh, complete abolition. Uh, com there is a complete abolition of lay potential. But sometimes the lay potential are not the VT secret. You see here is a epicardial map of an ARVD patient and here is the extended area of a scar, and this is where we found the lay potential. You see the lay potential here, and when indeed we, we mapped the VT, the VT was a little bit below. So here is where we found the lay potential, and the, the VT circuit was a little bit down. So this is the hismus, you see tiny lipot mesodiastolic potential, and here indeed we are at the exit side. So there is a mismatch. You can tell exactly from where we recorded the, um, the two, uh, the two Eight minutes. I think this is very important, is the future of subset mapping. And this is the research I'm performing at the Sarafelli Hospital. We are running simulation, mathematical simulation of the propagation of the art. So I'm quite convinced it's very important to, um, to tell which is the fast substrate, the endocardial or in the epicardial. So you see here, um, this is a screenshot. You can tell exactly the endocardial is getting slow while the epicardium, which is this one here, is getting fast. And also we are trying to characterize VT circuit not only the inner loop, but also the outer loop, because this is the most important part of the circuit, but also this is very important, so what is called the outer loop. And so we are exporting our map to MATLAB, which is our engineer software, and Two we are minutes. asking to um, characterize the velocity of conduction. So here you see this is the inner loop, at, at the entrance is going very slow, then the speed increase and then go slow again. And then you see this is the definition also of the outer loop. And this is the outer loop analyzed with the MATLAB. You see here is going very slow, it's getting higher again at the speed, slow, higher, slow, higher, and so on. So it's another way to represent, and I think this is the future of subset mapping, the, um, the, uh, the activation wavefront during VT. So also we are exporting the, uh, our map from Navex, from Rhythmia, from Carto to this software, and we are asking numerical simulation. So what we do is basically to pace from south. You see this is the circuit and is inducing VT, but is a very uh, polymorphic VT, different exit. While when you pace from the southeast, you see the um, pacing is crossing the scar, there is some bit, but then it's stopping. Indeed, when you pace from east, the, uh, the scar induces a VT and is sustained. Indeed, when you pace from other side, uh, the wavefront are crossing the scar, but are not inducing any kind of VT. 
So in conclusion, mapping is the most important step of VT ablation procedure. The multi-electrode multi-spline tools are the keys for the better definition of the electrical substrates. And substrate-based approach only is feasible by identification of the diastolic pathway should be always aimed. And the future is fast approaching with conduction velocity definition and with the prediction of the potential VT circuit. Just uh, say thank you to all the team, especially to, to Greek guys that are working with me, Dr. Alexio Agis and Dr. Georgios, Georgos Tsinakis. Thank you. Thank you, Adorno, for excellent talk. Have a seat, please. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, I think the substrate is the most important thing before to ablate, no? And the new technology give uh, to us the ideas where we have to go. And with this way, we have a successful ablation, okay? Okay, so it is for, uh, uh, we have a patient who with ischemic heart disease, mm -hmm. heart failure, and VT. The first approach is to go to ablate the substrate, the VT ablation, or to implant an ICD. Very good question, thank you. Well, I do believe uh, uh, there are some studies that showing that also first approach ablation in patients with several heart disease could be an option, but usually you should implant an ICD, you should treat them, you should treat the patient with drugs, and then if it's a, a recurrent VT, uh, well, you have to take him to the lab to uh, study the substrate, especially if these VT are slow and well tolerated. Okay, so for the patient, the safe is to go to implant an ICD, and then we have storm or yeah. slow VT, we case, have to ablate. Well, and if there is an arrhythmic storm for sure of incessant VT, absolutely you should take him to the lab. And there is also a recent paper on Europace mm -hmm. uh, that say that if you take him within the 24 hours, mm -hmm. so in one day from the admission, uh, the mortality uh, intra-hospital uh, is very low. While if you procrastinate and if you take the patient to the lab after the 24, 48 hours, the mortality is very high. So if the VT is incessant or uh, VT storm, immediately to the lab. You, you have to go immediately to VT Today, ablation. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, what is your idea? We have to go to ablate in the same time in an epicardia in the same time or we have to have a step to ablate at the beginning endocardial and if it is unsuccessful to go to epicardial? Well, if it's, uh, the first approach should be endo. If the electrophysiologic, uh, electrophysiologist is confident with the epicardial puncture, and if he doesn't find any VT secret, endo should go also epi. Depends also on the, on the scar where it is, but usually most of the VT, especially in the ischemic patient, are endocardial. Yes. So, okay, less epicardial for ischemic. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. What is your uh, opinion about dilatic cardi cardiomyopathy? We have some difference to approach VT, we have different to substrate. What do you think? Well, uh, ischemic are very easy, let's say, because the substrate is always endocardial. Why epicard well, for non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, more often is mesocardial, so it's uh, AP or intramyocardial, so it's often is uh, really a problem to ablate this patient. And also the recurrence of um, VT is quite high compared to the ischemic patient. So um, for ischemic, I'm sure the recurrence is, I mean, the literature demonstrate the uh, recurrence is very low, but as soon as you move to, di non -dil to dilated, uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, substrate is really difficult to map. So this is a real problem. So we have some difficulties for well, uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Yes, there are a lot of difficulties and imaging, I do believe, will help in the future to characterize where the scar is, I mean, and can guide. And maybe also the ablation, the new ablation technique, especially the needle, 
Uh, there is a new ablation catheter with a needle that is able to penetrate in the scar because in, non -dil in dilated non-ischemic patient, uh, the scar is inside the myocardium. Mm -hmm. Okay, the so issue. we have new, new instruments to yeah. go in the yeah. uh, myocardium. Okay. What do you think about VT and RVD? VTRVD has a very good outcome. Uh, the substrate is uh, epicardium mm -hmm. and uh, is often uh, easy to map. The VT are not very fast. So it's, I would not say easy, but uh, it's not like in uh, dilated non ischemic <coughs> cardiomyopathy. So the, the recurrence rate is really low of VT. So. Okay. Okay, and uh, what do you think about Bur Brugada VT and uh, ablation? Brugada VT and ablation is a really hot topic now. I do believe um, um, in patients with several storms with VF, mm -hmm. with the VT, so, well, VF mainly, uh, and several ICD shocks, the ablation could be contemplated. Okay. The ablation could be contemplated. Um, because there is some, I mean, some, you can tell, you can do something, you can modify the substrate. Prevention of arrhythmias in patients that are okay, that have no symptoms, no shocks of the ACD, well, in that case, I don't think ablation will solve the problem. Okay. And what do you think about HOCM AVT? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is like non-dilated ischemic cardiomyopathy. It's a very deep substrate, so it's uh, really difficult to, to, ablate. to ablate. So because you cannot penetrate in the substrate, you can modify the substrate, but you can't tell, I'm sure I eliminated everything. Okay. So we have a patient 20 years old, HOC, ICD, and a lot of shocks. Uh, we have, we can do something for this Absolutely. young patient. Absolutely, to go to ablate. Absolutely, okay. because if you are lucky, or I mm -hmm. mean, you can easily um, identify the substrate, and you can uh, make, uh, I mean, a good prognosis for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, at least, is an attempt. Okay. But you can leave the patient is, with 20 Okay, shots. it is very difficult, but it's the last attempt yeah. for this patient. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's your opinion about medicine's MVT? About? Uh, pharmacology's approach to MVT. Well, I think it always, should be always contemplated in our laboratory. Um, before the patient come to the lab, we, we use all the spectrum of, of drugs, so from mexilatine to the usual amiodarone, uh, procanamide, so we use all the drugs and I think uh, every electrophysiologist and cardiologist should know the, uh, how to use them and when to stop them also before the ablation. Okay, so the first step is to use the medicine before to ablate? Well, if the patient can't tolerate DVT the and these are no... Uh, giving, uh, I mean, so many shocks for the patient. So mm -hmm. the first attempt should be always drug. Okay. And, uh, and then if the, the re recurrent VT recurrence are so high, well, you have to take the patient to the lab. Okay. So what do you prefer to go to give uh, B blockers and amiodarone? What are your steps? Well, for sure, the fir depends also on the ischemic, on the cardiomyopathy in behind. So, for Occam patient, for sure, amiodarone is the first step, uh, together with beta blockers. Uh, ischemic are answering very well to beta blockers. Um, also, lidocaine for ischemic patients. So, uh, these are, I think, the fr my three favorite drugs. So, first, beta blockers in every patient, then amiodarone and lidocaine for acute incessant VT. Okay. And then maxillitin. If lidocaine fails, maxillitin is a, a really nice, a really excellent drug. Okay, okay. So, Hanashi, Piscati. Uh, at the moment, uh, congratulations, very excellent talk. 
And I think that uh, all the uh, questions about the, uh, the issue have been uh, contemplated. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Georgos Kurianidis, do you have any questions? You show us very, in a very excellent uh, manner the way the substrate behaves uh, during various uh, pacing sites. Do you think that in the future we can see more on uh, autonomic neural influences on uh, substrate uh, behavior, autonomic thanks. nervous system? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, yeah, I think there is a um, certain degree of contribution by the sympathetic tone to the VT circuit, but I don't think it has some influence on the beginning. So the beginning is always a electro pure electrophysiology. And then maybe I agree with you that the sustain of the VT, so if the VT sustain uh, and also the triggering of extra bit is based on the autonomic tone. So that's why we have to use beta blockers. And about the ganglion, uh, yeah, at, at, at my hospital, at our hospital, we, we um, at my institution, we do uh, stellar, I mean, the, this operation in a certain case where drugs fail, where VT ablation fail, uh, and we did the last case in a 55 year old man with, uh, ischem with, not, with dilated non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy and uh, after free, free attempt of VT, the uh, patient had always a VT shock. So in that case, we, we performed the ganglion stellum operation. Okay, any questions, please? Okay, thank you. Antonio, for your talk was very nice to meet you. Thank you very much. <laughs>